our Redeemer, to the Holy Spirit, our Comforter, and God, I just want to ask you a simple question. Anybody glad to be saved? Because I've just, I've seen this matriculation of the church into shouting about things that if you don't have Jesus, it is a vapor. Anybody glad that you're your life, your soul is in what the old scripture would call the ark of safety. That when I die, I know exactly where I'm going. And that is to be in the arms of Jesus. Anybody just want to praise God for that? Hallelujah. We're, we're, um, we're in this discussion about passion this month. Um, if I were you, I can't tell you what to do, but I would just dedicate the next 12 months of my life to getting the rest of my life on track. I'm serious. I, how many of y'all keep hearing me say this over and over and over again? I know what the Lord showed me. I know what he showed me. I got a prophecy this morning that almost blew my mind from somebody who I have a relationship with their parents, but I don't have a relationship with them uh, close. And here's the craziest thing. The father and the person who gave me the prophecy texted me at the same time. They don't even live in the same city. The Lord started to download in my spirit about what he's going to release through me to release to you over the next 13 months, including this month. And if I were you, If I were you, I would not play for the next year. I'm talking about putting, like going in the grind mode for a year so that the rest of your life can just ascend. And listen, this is what he told me. At the end of the year that we're going to work, he's going to give you sweatless victories. Uh, you, can, you can mark my words. You're going to win with less effort in the future than when you were grinding hard and sweating because now you're going to be pointed in the right direction. And when you get that thing in line, you're going to find out you didn't have to swing as hard as you swung. You just have to get in the right alignment. Somebody say alignment. If you are willing to ride. I know it's a long commitment. I know it seems long, but is one year worth of focus worth you being financially free, psychologically free, emotionally free through your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s? I'm going to teach you in a year how to keep the devil off your back the rest of your life. Who's going to go with me? I'm serious. Tell your neighbor you can't get tired this year. You can't get frustrated this year. Listen, you can't even catch a cold this year. You drink your vitamin C. You can't even miss a Sunday. Who got time for COVID? You can't catch it. Because every time we meet, God's, I haven't preached a sermon since the Lord gave me this revelation. I've just been talking messages. I don't have a sermon today. He's been downloading messages in my spirit, and it just won't stop. It just won't stop. I have, I have been under an unction with the Holy Spirit that I've never experienced in my life. And the flow will not end. The oil is getting ready to come down Aaron's beard and onto the garments, and you are the garment. Somebody shout, I'm the garment, and I want the oil. 
No, you didn't say, I'm the garment and I want you. I'm talking to you online because they ain't talking to me in this house. I'm, I, I got to wait till I get north for them to talk to me. I said, I am the garment. Somebody say, I'm the garment and I want the oil. Now, South, y'all better learn how to handle me. I ain't just talking to be talking. When I release something, you better grab it because the opportunity of a lifetime only is good for the lifetime of the opportunity. You don't have forever. These doors are going to close. Touch your neighbor and say, you better get in where you fit in. I'm going to read two passages of scripture. And if I got a woman in this house that believe that God is calling you for more, this is probably your word. Fellas, I got your back. Don't trip, cuz. I got you. I ain't going to leave you out. When I said that, the fellas was like, put on my, my Javanchi to come out here and listen. Listen, I got one for you, but there is, there, is, there is a woman in here. It's like you are nervous about what you see. You're nervous about it. Because number one, you've never seen anybody do what you're thinking. And number two, all of your life, you thought you had to have help to do it. What woman am I talking to online? Okay. Y'all got somewhere to go? Because if you got somewhere to go, we can do the benediction now. We good? All right. I ain't playing with you. Okay. When you get to work tomorrow, you're going to still be emotional. Judges chapter 4, verse 5. Some of y'all need to send this link to your sister when you get out of church. And Deborah, a prophetess, let me skip to verse 5 because I only want to talk about this. She basically was called to do a job, and the Bible says she did it under a palm tree. She didn't wait till anybody invited her in. She didn't wait until they made a position for her. God told her what to do, and she couldn't find a place to do it, so she did it where she was. Are you listening to me? This goes for everybody in here. You better stop waiting on everything to be perfect before you start. If you got to start it in your garage, you start it. Get you a desk and a green screen. And when you answer the phone, make people think you got an office. I want you to get you a nice clip of a good office and get you a green screen behind you. I want you to act like you're a multinational company in your garage. Mm, it's only for 3% of y'all. I got it. I need the other 97 of y'all to get out of the way. Who, who are my 3%? Who am I talking to? Okay. I don't need nothing in the way. Touch your neighbor and say, don't be in my way today. Don't be in my way. I ain't got time for you today. Get out of my way. All right, let's go to Judges 5, 6, and 7, and 12. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. Somebody say the highways were unoccupied. See, this is, this is a good thing because let me tell you, right now the lane that I'm talking to you about is unoccupied, but after I finish preaching, a whole lot of people are going to try to get in that street. So you better get started because right now the lane is open. Ain't nobody even thinking about doing what you're thinking about doing right now. That's why you got to start right now because the lane is unoccupied. Okay? The street is unoccupied. And the travelers walked through the byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, finally found out who I was and I got up. You, see, they ain't been paying attention to you. But the moment you find out who you are. Your phone getting ready to start ringing. Your DM about to start blowing up. But you ain't going to have time, Deborah. You ain't got time. If they didn't know you. Are you listening to me? Stephanie, do you hear me? She says, I rose a mother in Israel. Go to verse 12. I feel the Holy Spirit. And just in case, Deborah, you don't hear what I'm saying, wake up. Wake up. Deborah, 
Matter of fact, I'm going to say wake up and you shout your name. Wake up. Wake up. And utter a song. And Barak, and they led that captivity captive. Basically, they got so free that everybody that was with them got out too. Tell everybody on your road, when I get out, all y'all coming with me. I'm, I got so much oil on my life that when I get out, that's why you better be glad God got you on the right road today. Do a pew check. Make sure you got the right people next to you. Unless we got to do some musical chairs. To you in overflow, to you at home, make sure you got the right people in the room. Now, what I'm getting ready to preach, the title is not going to make sense unless you pay attention and be with me through the end. God told me to talk about tested by trees tested by trees you may be seated in the presence of the Lord I'm telling you right now I feel glory on my life <laughs> anybody uh, been paying attention to Olympic sports specifically track and field lately by the way, shout out to Coco yesterday for winning the U.S. Open and another shout out to Colorado football for just shocking the world. Have you been paying attention? God's doing something through sports. When you ever seen a U.S. champion break down and you hear, to God be the glory? Something's happening. Because God doesn't always preach in pulpits. Sometimes he preaches on tennis courts and football fields. There's another place that he's been preaching on the track. There's, there's this girl. Have you heard of a Shikari Richardson? For those of y'all who don't know, because some of y'all don't care nothing about sports, Shikari Richardson right now is the fastest woman. And she is a black woman in the world. I knew you would clap because that's where she is, but not, let me tell you where she was. Because most people love to praise God for the destination, but they have no patience for the journey. Shikari's mother all but abandoned her, gave her up, she was raised by her grandmother. She didn't even know that her biological mother had died until after a race, a reporter takes a microphone and puts it in her face and asks her what is her response to her mother's death. She finds out that her mother dies from a reporter. Can you imagine the abandonment issue? that must live within the heart of a young woman who didn't even have anybody in her family who thought enough to tell her or call her and say, your mother has died. Now, it doesn't matter. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm speaking from experience because even though you may have a parent who wasn't in your life, because they gave you life, they can't cease to have life and it not affect your life. My biological father didn't raise me, but the moment he died, the wind came out of my cell because there is no way to be connected to the tree and your leaves don't shake when the winds blow. She finds out that her mother dies from a complete stranger devoid of any capacity of compassion. How you feel about your mama dying? And that's how she found out. So what does she do? She goes and smokes some weed to escape the pain of what was going on. Now, I don't, don't judge it because some of y'all don't even really need a reason to smoke yours. I mean, 
Come here. Look at your boy. Holler at your boy. She did it because her mama died. You did it because it's tomorrow. <laughs> and just because you got it with a prescription. Listen. She struggled and turned to trees. Smoked weed, and they banned her from practicing and racing in Olympic competition for an entire month. Now, we just shouted about the fact that she was the fastest woman in the world, but what we don't know or what we are not talking about is that when she got uh, tested positive for smoking weed and banned from competition, probably from somebody who uses weed medicinally, which is, which is why I'll go on record to say that something needs to happen in our criminal justice system when we can have men in prison for 20 and 30 years for marijuana and the judge smokes it too. I don't mind being quoted saying that. This girl is prohibited from running for a month. And when she comes back, Shikari comes back in her first race after the month's suspension. She comes in dead last. Oh, and we clapping for it right now, but y'all, let me tell y'all how y'all was acting on the internet. I can't stand two-faced people. That she is an embarrassment to the race. And, 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 and we were talking about her. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's applauding. She was canceled by black people, disrespected by everybody else. And when they put that microphone in her face after she lost that race, that girl said some of the most powerful words that I've ever heard. She said, and I quote in her post-race interview, I wanted to be able to come and perform having a month off. I'm not upset at myself. This is one race. I'm not done. And you know what I'm capable of. And if I don't preach nothing else, can I get about 300 people in this room and 5,000 of you online to look at somebody and say these words? I'm not done yet. You know what I'm capable of. Or you better look at somebody and say, I'm not done yet. And you don't, you don't even know what I really can do. You ain't seen me at my best yet. You ain't seen me play my best game. You haven't seen me at, at my strongest moment. I've been through a little bit of a depression here lately. I've been through a little bit of a set. I've been going through some stuff. I ain't been as strong as I used to be. I don't even believe in myself, but I feel something happening on the inside of me. And if I ever find that groove again, slap that girl and say, Stella about to get her groove back. If I ever find my slot again, if I ever find that thing again, I'm not done and I I can do better. Just slap somebody and say, I'm not done. You better tell them because they think you done. They think that because they saw you cry, they can come in and take over. They think that because they saw you fail, that you are finished. But it was one race. It was one moment. It was one mistake. And I prophesy a comeback. I said, I prophesy a comeback. I must be talking to the wrong room. I said, I prophesy a comeback. Your boss gonna have to apologize for what they said to you. Your ex is gonna have to apologize for how they treated you. You are getting ready to win again. So put these words in your phone or write it on your mirror in lipstick so that you can give yourself affirmations or put it on a sticky note and put it on your steering wheel. So that every time you look at it, you can say, I'm not done yet. And you know what I'm capable of. How many of y'all got that kind of swag in you? I'm, I'm not done yet. And I know what I'm capable of. If you don't know who I am, I'm about to show you. If you don't know who I am, just watch. Over the next 12 months, I'm going to give you something to watch. Over the next 12 months, I'm going to give you something to hate on. Over the next 12 months, I'm going to give you something to troll because I'm about to turn this thing around. I'm just looking for my click today. I can't, I, I'm not even preaching to the whole church. I'm just looking for my ride or dies who understand that all things are working together for your good. 
I dare you be silent and I'm in the building with good news. I dare you look at me like what God is about to do is going to be casual. What God is about to do in your life is going to deserve a greater praise than that. And I'm not going to give it to you so then you can praise him. I want to see if you can praise him in advance for something that I guarantee that God's going to do in your life. So she, Pastor Rama, she turned to trees. And don't you judge her, because everybody got a tree. Every one of you got something you hide under when it gets tough. Everything, every one of us in here and watching online, you got something you hug when you don't feel like you have help. Everybody's got a tree. Ask your neighbor, say, what's your tree? I bet you they don't tell you. Ask, what's your tree? What they gonna do? Get out of my business. What my tree ain't got nothing to do with you. I don't need to know about your tree. And don't you ask me about my tree. But everybody got a tree. Everybody got somewhere they go when they feel insecure. Everybody got somewhere they go psychologically when they need to feel validated. Everybody's got a tree. And don't let anybody make you feel like you less than them. Because... You got something they don't have. Everybody got something that somebody else don't have. See, you saved, but you still got sinner problems. Come on, you got the Holy Ghost, but it ain't always got you. Huh? Anybody going to be honest in here today? Just tell your neighbor, you catch me on the wrong day, you won't even know I ever been to church in my whole life. <laughs> Catch me when I'm hungry and frustrated. You're going to see a side of me. Can I help anybody today? The story of Deborah in Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5 begins and ends like many of the dramas in all of our lives. And that is, in this life you will have trouble. In this life, you will have trials and tribulations. You're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. You're going to have real friends and you're going to find out that some of them were fake friends. It is what it is. There are some days you're going to get up out of the bed and you're going to feel like you can conquer the world and there are going to be some days you get out of the bed and you're going to want to lay back in it because you feel like the world is conquering you. And it is what it is. There are days you're going to get up and you're going to feel like I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And there are going to be days that you wake up and feel like you're being crucified. There are ups and there's downs. But those of us who wait on the Lord, we renew our strength. And all of our trials eventually turn into triumphs. I know what I'm talking about. And in the book of Judges, what we're looking at, and I need you to pay attention to me today. In the book of Judges, what we're actually looking at is the cycle of what happens when men involve themselves in divine proclivity. What I mean by that is, is that God creates us. He gives us a path for renewed resistance. We sin. God gives us an opportunity to repent. We refuse to repent, and then we have judgment. And after the judgment, then we decide God isn't good. And here comes the cycle. Satan tempts you, you take the temptation, God says don't do it, you do it anyway, God says repent, you don't repent, God judges, you pray, nothing happens, God ain't good. God says no. Seven times, Israel, in 300 years, you rebelled against me. This one, you're going to have to figure out on your own. Because I kept giving you an opportunity to cry out to me, but you decided that you wanted to stay where you had lamb stew and where you had water and you had manna falling from heaven or whatever particular predicament you were in. You decided that me pushing you forward was too abrasive and you would rather settle for the comfort of your history. And now you're in a situation where you got to figure out whether your choices can hold you like I can. And so Israel, I'm going to let you stay in this one for a while because I delivered you from 400 years of slavery and you still doubt me? 
I bring you through 40 years of wilderness experience and yet you still doubt me. I don't know what else I have to do. I brought water out of a rock. I had quail to fall from the sky to feed you. I had a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of a cloud by day. I parted Red Seas. I parted the Jordan River. I dealt with your enemies and you still doubt me? Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. He says, I even told you in Psalms, I'm near to the brokenhearted and I love those who are crushed in spirit and yet you wouldn't bring your broken heart to me and you wouldn't bring me your crushed spirit and so you tried other things and now you want me to immediately respond and make you a priority after you made me an opportunity. He says, I'm going to do it because I love you but not without you dealing with this oppression. I want to know, is there anybody in here that knows that what you're going through, had you done something different when the Lord was whispering to you? Come on, talk to your boy. Come here. It, 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 he, if, if you would have, you even, the Lord whispered to you. He told you, he said, go left. He was like, no, God, I'm going I'm to go. I know you want me to go to Tarshish, but I'm going to go over here and see what Nineveh is like. And then when the whale swallows you, Lord! When are you going to get me out of here? God says, I'll get you out, Jonah, but you're going to have to pray and you're going to have to praise. And the Bible says for four days and four nights, he prayed and he prays and eventually the fish spit him out on dry ground. God says, I delivered you from Egypt. I did all of this. And here is the word of the Lord. And yet somehow God finds a way to love Israel enough to restore them. I only, who, who, who clapped? Identify yourself. No, no, seriously, who clapped? I heard a clap. Come here. Come here. Yes. Now watch how many people start clapping now. He said, he said, God says, I will restore you. See what you don't, I knew you did not know what the word restored mean because if you had known what restored mean when I said it, you would have broke the roof on this place. I'm getting ready to give you the definition of restored and see if you have the same response. The etymology of the word restored literally means that God says, I am about to free you from the effects of your bad decision. You missed it. You missed it. He says, I am about to do something. Watch this. I'm about to consider what you did. I'm going to show you the consequences. But because I love you so much, I'm going to free you from what you earned. Just touch three people and say, God will restore you. God is about to restore you from the repercussions of a bad decision. Some of you all had already decided in your life that your life wasn't going to be good because of something you did. God says, I'm about to step in the middle of your mess and I'm about to wipe away your repercussions. And watch this. I'm going to justify you and I'm going to allow you to walk into the next dimension of your life just as if you didn't do it. I, I got to get back to Rankin Road. I can't handle it. I'm looking for somebody who will give God the type of glory that is necessary when you did it and God still throws it into the sea of forgiveness. I need you to give three people a high five and say God's going to restore you. God's going to restore you. You won't even have a bad mark on your credit report. There won't be a bad mark on your resume. By the time you get to the next dimension and to the next place that God wants to use you, they won't even know where you came from, what you did, because God is going to erase the repercussions of a bad decision. Anybody need God to restore them? Somebody shout, restore me, Lord, restore me, restore me, restore me, restore me. I'm about to put my name in the hat for a big opportunity, but I don't need my past catching up with me. Restore me, restore me, God. I'm about to put my resume in for a situation, but I don't need them to find out how I acted a fool on my last job. Restore me, restore me, God. I'm about to have another child, and I don't need any repercussions because of what kind of child I was. Restore me, restore me, restore me, God. I'm about to get in another relationship, and I don't need this relationship reflecting the last relationship. Restore me, restore me. Anybody need God to restore them? 
God says, they locked you out, but I'm about to reinstate you. Ooh, that's good to me. That's good to me. That God says, I'm about to reinstate you. I'm about to put you back in front of the line. I'm going to put your name back on lists where you've been canceled. I'm going to get you in rooms before great men. And let me tell you, the people who canceled you are going to try to figure out how you got in front of them and they never left the room. I speak a leapfrog experience over your life. You about to jump over people who've been stepping on you. I need somebody in this room to give another neighbor a high five and say, baby, your future is bright. You gonna need sunglasses where you going. You gonna need some hater blockers where you going. Because where God is about to take you, no man. Somebody say, he's gonna restore me. I'm just standing right there, he's gonna restore me. He's going to restore you to the point where you stop beating yourself up. Because, see, there's a lot of things you're beating yourself up about that you think other people know. That's, that's not them. That's your conscience. God says, I'm about to clear your conscience so that you can love you again. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm about to clear your conscience so you stop beating yourself up over that bad decision and that bad mistake. And I'm going to allow you to walk into your future reinstated and restored. Thus is the word of the Lord. So lift up your head. Oh, ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king. Stop walking around with your head down because you made a mistake somewhere in your past. God says, I ain't thinking about that. I give gifts without repentance. I knew you were freaky when I called you. I knew you were nasty when I anointed you. I knew you had an attitude when I decided to use you. And I'm going to use all of that. Look at some people say, ooh, I'm talking to you though. See, this is, this is why we can't get it, because we think somehow we're going to skate past the entrance without the one who knows all. Like he's going to prevent you entrance into the next level because you did something that he found out about when he called you. Did you not know God knew who David was when he called him? God knew who Abraham was when he called him. God knew who Isaac was when he called him. And God knew who Jacob and Esau were. And yet he called them any way. Because God is going to restore you. And your future will not be locked. Because you had bad incidents in your past. And some people are not clapping because they think they bad ain't as bad as your bad. But all of our best is filthy rags before God. Somebody shout, I'm restored. Say it again, I'm restored. Say it again, I'm restored. You are free to live again. You are free to succeed. You are free to date. I'm talking to somebody. Go ahead and date again. It's time for you to get out there. Listen, God has restored you. You don't owe anybody sadness so that you feel good about your discrepancies. You're not doing God a favor walking around with your head down and you're still sorry about something you did 20 years ago. God ain't thinking about it. Why are you? Somebody shall restore me. Watch this. Watch this. God says, I'm about to reinstate you. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. He said, I'm going to reinstate you, but you got to have the right attitude. He says, Israel... I want to go with you, but y'all get on my nerve. No, you don't believe me? Go read Exodus chapter 33, verse 3. He says, listen, I want to lead you into the promised land where it's flowing with milk and honey. He says, but I can't go with you because if I go with you, I'm going to consume you because you are a stiff-necked people. Let's see how loud you are in the next five minutes. He says, you're a stick-necked people. I tell you what to do and you do what you want to do. I let the word be revealed to you and you are in your seat hearing the word right now, bouncing it off your own opinion. I'm telling you right now what thus said the Lord, but you bouncing it off your own thought process and you're trying to figure out if I'm telling the truth and you think that I'm not telling the truth because it runs into your opinion. But let me tell you, only the only person in here that is speaking what God is saying and what thus said the Lord is me. Everybody else is thinking within their own spirit. 
And he says, you're stiff-necked people. And the Lord released me to tell you something. He says, tell the people of the Lighthouse and those in Lighthouse Nation watching online. He says, don't ever allow your neck to get in the way of your necks. You hard head, stiff neck, opinionated person. You uncircumcised Philistine. Come here, talk to me. He says, I'm trying to give you the word of life, but you keep telling me what your grandmama said. I'm trying to give you life, and you keep telling me what your experience has taught you. Slap your neck and say, wake up. You ain't sleepy now. Wake up. Don't text now. Ain't nobody calling you now. I need all the stiff-necked people to identify yourself. Stubborn as a mule. You know what the Lord said, but you still pulling in your own direction. Wondering why you won't get God's blessing. Because his blessing is not in the direction of your opinion. So God says, I'm going to leave you alone because if I go with you, I'm going to consume you because you make me sick. Come here, Revelation. He says, Church of Laodicea, I have spewed you out of my mouth because you are neither hot nor cold. In other words, God says, I don't care if you're hot or cold. I just need you to make a decision. He said, you are lukewarm, so you make my stomach upset. I need you to be hot or cold. Be either one of them. God, I can handle you whatever temperature you are, but I can't take the fact that you haven't made up in your mind which temperature you're going to be because I can't handle you in neutral. Somebody say stiff-necked. Watch this. I need, you need scripture for me to prove it? Proverbs 29 and 1 says, Whoever remains stiff-necked after my rebuke will suddenly be destroyed. Woo. Preach, Keon. Preach in this house. Preach, black man. Preach, tall man. Preach, bald man. Call me whatever you want, but I'm preaching. Let me tell you something. Whenever you are in the presence of a rebuke and you hold on to your horses, you will suddenly be destroyed. Thus is the word of the Lord. Watch this. And I want you to see it in the King James Version of the Bible. Watch what it says. Suddenly be destroyed. Two words that come after it. Without remedy. When you get a word like this. And it don't rebuke you to soften your stance. You shall suddenly be destroyed. And can't nobody fix it. So you better get off your high horse. You got about 20 more minutes to get with me on this sermon. Some of y'all still sitting there. You won't clap. You won't say amen. You won't shout because you don't like the way it's coming out. But I'm rebuking you so that I can push you into your destiny. Because God doesn't have time in the future for somebody who's going to be questioning him. You're going to have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. If God says start it, start it. If he says stop it, stop it. If he says endure it, endure it because he's about to reinstate and restore you. Who am I preaching to in here today? So what we see happening in the text is a result of God telling Israel what to do and Israel telling God what to do. Do you know who you think you is? Around here telling God, God, I know what you said, but uh, I was just thinking, why is you thinking when God is talking? <laughs> Look at me. Who you is? <laughs> Who do you think you are to tell God what you think about the matter? God says, this is what they told him. He said, Moses, you done brought us out here to die, at least where we were. We had something to eat and water. You done brought us out here to die. No, I brought you out here because this is where God told me to bring you. And what you don't know is that the water you were receiving had strings attached. The glory is attached to the water you haven't had yet. So you can, you can either drink Pharaoh's water and have strings attached, or you can wait on me to disperse the water and have glory attached. 
And by the way, I'm the living water and those who drink of me will never thirst again. The reason why you thirsty is because you've been drinking somebody else's water. God says, but if you drink of me, you will never thirst again. Is there anybody in here that a shot? I'm tired of being thirsty. I've been drinking all of this water and I'm still thirsty. I'm looking for a love that when it loves me, I feel love. They sinned against God because they wouldn't trust him. And the Bible says that he let a king come in. He let a king come in. And here they are now, listen, under another 20 years of oppression. Ain't you tired of being tired? Come on, y'all, holler at your boy. Like, anybody like, dang! Jesus, I mean, how many storms I got to go through? I mean, how many times... Do I have to feel my heart palpitating? How many times do I have to look at my hair in the sink? How many times do I have to go through another heartbreak? How many times do I have to date the wrong person? How many lessons do I need? Anybody tired? Come on now. I, I, I know we want to act like we all got it together, but anybody is sick and tired of being tired and tired of being sick and tired, I'm tired of being, I'm just tired of being tired. I don't even know what I'm tired of, but I'm just tired of being tired. Any, anybody so tired, you just went in a room and just screamed and, and, and banged your pillow up against the wall, just, just for no reason, just tired. God says, okay, you tired? Now let's start the test. Because it is only when you come to the end of yourself that you get to the beginning of God. God says, the reason why you haven't seen me yet is I keep seeing you. And when you back out of the process, I'll step in. Somebody say, trust him. Notice... The Bible says that King Rabin from Canaan came, Cody, King Rabin from Canaan came to them. Okay. Where did he come from? Canaan. Y'all listening? I just said it. Where did he come from? Where are they headed? So he coming from where they're on their way to. Because see, a lot of people think if they get out of the past, they clear. <laughs> see, if you, most people think that if I just get away from where I am, it'll be good. But their next trouble didn't come from behind them. Their next issue is coming from where they are headed. You know why? Because when God has something ready for you, and you are not ready for it. I'm going to talk to you all at home because they don't get it. When God has something ready for you and you are not ready for it, watch this. At first, your future is an enemy. See, See when you still stiff-necked and rebellious, your future isn't an escape from your past. It's your next enemy. Ooh, that was so cold. I can't. Oh, I just said something good. When you are not ready for what God has for you, escaping your past is worse than going into your future. You getting ready to walk into something that was designed to be a blessing, but it's going to be a burden because your neck is still stiff. And that's when you say stuff like, if it ain't one thing. That ain't God. That's you. Your future is an enemy when you are inflexible. Hmm. Who am I talking to? I told you next 12 months, we about to shut the devil up. We're going to bust him upside his head. I can't stand him. 
when you become flexible, and here's what the Bible says, and you can hear sound doctrine. There has to, when you hit the Holy Spirit in your heart, sound doctrine hit different. When you don't operate under the Holy Spirit, rebuke feels bad. When you operate in the Holy Spirit, rebuke leads to reprovement and refinement. And, and you hear rebuke differently when you operate in the Holy Ghost. Some of y'all right now here like, oh, he get on my nerve. And some people like, that word, that word, give me more word, give me more word. I want to be free. Talk to me however you got to talk to me. Just get me to my destiny. I am not called to people who need sugar in their Kool-Aid. I'm called to people who can take it right out of the package. I'm called to people who say, listen, I just want the blessing and I trust the word that is coming out of your mouth. Give it to me the way God gave it to you. That's who I'm called to. God says, I love you, but I let them oppress you. I love you, but I let it happen. In fact, when the devil asked me for permission, Job, I gave it to him. I let him test you to see what you would do if you lost your children and your cattle and your money and your wife told you to curse me and die. I let it happen just to see if you would trust me. Job says, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing to me at all. But though you slay me, yet, I wonder, is there 50 people that got a yet will I trust you praise? I'm going to give you 30 seconds to show them, though you slay me, I'm still going to worship. Though you slay me, I'm still going to give. Though you slay me, I'm still going to love. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Watch this. Go back and read the Bible. Their oppression didn't stop until the Bible says they cried out. Don't make me, don't, don't. I, every time I say cried out, I feel something. The Bible says that they cried out to the Lord. What does the word cry out mean? Those of y'all who, who, are, who are cry out conference goers. Cry out literally means, whenever you cry out to God, it is literally an admission that I have come to the end of me. Oh, Jesus. It's like saying, it's like saying, God, I ain't got nothing left. In fact, I'm going to give you these problems because I know that you are a problem solver. Anybody come to the end of yourself today to say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I am depending on you to see me through. I'm placing it in your hands, God. I don't know what to do with these kids. They're yours. Come on, somebody, somebody just need to, somebody just, need to uh, just imagine you got all your children right now. Hey, Lord, no, they're not yours, no way. That, that's, that's your problem. You think they're yours. You, no, no, you, you are not a parent by ownership. You're a parent by stewardship. And whatever, whatever ailments, sicknesses, disabilities, whatever your child has is because God put in you the patience and the skill set to work to bring that person up to his glory. That's why they are yours by stewardship, not by ownership. You don't own a child. Ask Hannah about Eli. They're not yours. They're not yours. That's why you ain't, you ain't got to fight the principal. That's God's child. You, ain't got, you can fight for him, but you ain't got to fight with him. Let God stand still. I'm just, I'm just looking for people who don't have a backup plan. Like it's either God or nothing. I, I can't preach to people who got a plan B and a plan C. It's either God or nothing. Just tap your neighbor. If it's, it's either God or nothing. Just tell your neighbor. It's either God 
or nothing. I don't have a backup plan. I ain't got a contingency plan. I don't have an option C. It's either going to be God or nothing at all. I'm looking for people who know when the bush is burning, it's still God. When you got to have, when you got to wait 90 years to have a son, and then you got to march him up a mountain and almost stick a knife in his chest, it's still God. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And, and when you got to work for Rachel for 14 years at a promise for seven days, it's still God, you got to know that when it's rough, when it's hot, when it's tough, it's still. I got fired. I got a divorce. They saw spots on the CAT scan. My home is in turmoil. My finances are going backwards. I got more outgo than I got income. I'm insecure. Reject it. Experience death. I feel like I'm about to lose it all. I'm a week away from my business going out of business. I'm married, but I can't stand them. I birthed them, but I don't like them. My father hurt me bad. My mama can't heal me. Still God. Stop thinking it's only God when it's working in your favor. It was a tragedy, but it was still God. You lost it all, but it was still God, and he just wanted to know if you would bring him the empty water pots so he could turn your water into wine. Still, God. I got to get to the woman before I let y'all go. I didn't mean to say all of that. I'm sorry. Is I'm, am I good, Caleb? I'm good. Because um, I made y'all promise about this lady. Y'all got a couple of minutes? So prior to this... Um, Situation. God started using judges to rule Israel. I'm going to give you a little theological lesson. If you go back and read the Bible, the Bible lets us know that there were 13 judges in the days of Israel. You can also correspond that to the fact that 13 times it stopped raining in Israel and they had a famine. You know why? Because every time God used a judge to get them to the next level, they rebuked or they rebelled against that judge. And then God calls the famine because when God sends you an answer and you don't adhere to it, he dries it up. <laughs> Every dry season of your life can be connected to disobedience. Yes, ma'am. Because you'll go through things, but when it, see a famine is an extended period of drought. Anytime you have a season in your life that's extended, it's because you were disobedient. Anytime you bleed for 12 years, it's because you went to the wrong doctor for 12 years. It's the one day you got to the right doctor, you stopped bleeding. Anytime you lay on the bed for 38 years, it's because you were waiting on the water when you could have just picked up your bed and walked. Every extended period and drought in your life is connected to a disobedience that God can't get you to climb over. Help me, Holy Ghost. And this is what happened in the text. 20 years. But before Deborah was a judge, there were three people that preceded her. Three judges before her. One was Othniel, one was Shamgar, and the other was Ehud. Now, the Bible says that Othniel delivered Israel from eight years of bondage. Everybody say eight years. Eight years. They come out of that. Now, the next judge, Ehud, he delivers them from another 18 years of bondage. Now, listen, these ain't even including the 400 years and all the other stuff they had to go through. 
So he delivers them. Now, Ehud, let's talk about him. The Bible says that Ehud was a left-handed man. And when I, when I saw that, I couldn't skip past it because I went to read it. His, his right hand literally atrophied and didn't work. So have you ever seen someone who had been stricken by a stroke and, and, and a part of their body withers? So Ehud's right hand didn't work, but God called him to be a judge. So God calls him to be a judge, and he finds a way to serve the king that has his people under oppression. So now the king trusts him to get close enough. He don't know that he's about to be taken out by the person that he's trusting. And so when he goes in to kill the king, what's, what's, what's wrong with his right hand? It's withered. So the Bible says that he hides a knife on his right side. So when he comes in to kill the king, he walks in and they frisk him. But they only frisk him. On his strong side. And because they took his weakness for granted. He reached into his weakness. And the Bible says, stab the man until the knife came through his stomach and out of his back. What if I told you that God's about to bring strength out of your weakness? God says, I'm about to allow you to walk into every dimension and take out every enemy that took your weakness for granted. I don't know who that is for, but I need 13 people to begin to shout that there's a strength coming out of your weakness. I got enough strength on my weak side to kill my devil. I got enough strength on my weak side to slay my demons. If I'm talking to somebody in here, lift up your voice and give them a praise. I gotta get, I gotta get, I gotta get to the woman. I gotta get to the woman. Shamgar is the third judge. Go back and read the Bible. He killed 600 people by himself with a stick. Bible says an ox gold. He killed 600 men. How many people in here think that you could kill everybody in this room with just a stick? Try it. You might get two or three of us, but number four, five, and six going to stump the life out of you. You got to be anointed to kill 600 men with a stick, and he did it. And here comes the fourth judge. She ain't no man, though. She a woman. So she going to have to learn how to lead differently because she ain't about to stab nobody. She ain't about to stick nobody with a stick, so... This is what the Bible says. Ha! She becomes the next judge of Israel, and she's the only judge in the history of Israel to be called both a judge and a prophet. So I'm going to tell you something, women. Y'all better wake up because the men are asleep. Oh, yeah, the men are asleep. Go back and read the history of the scripture. When Eve was brought into the world, Adam was asleep. When, when the Holy Spirit delivered the news that the baby inside of Mary was the Holy Ghost's baby, Joseph was asleep. And when Jesus got up out of the tomb, all of the disciples were somewhere asleep, but there was a woman named Mary Magdalene. I need all the woke women in this room to begin to shout, it's my season and my turn. I'm next in line and I ain't waiting on no man to validate me. I'm going to own the company if I got to do it single. I need the women watching me online and every woman in this house to shout, I'm next in line. I can't hear no woman in here. I said, I'm next in line. Watch this. But what she does is she recognizes that she can't get the job done like her predecessors. So the Bible says that she calls herself the mother of Israel. She says, because I can't be a warrior, but I can do something the fellas can't do. I can give birth. I don't know who this word is for, 
But I want to talk to every woman in this room and online that know you got something inside of you. I dare you, in the spirit, slap every woman you can reach and say, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. Some of y'all scared to say it because of the natural. But I want you to climb over that, and I want you to shout it in the spirit, say, say I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. Now, now, the reason why I need you to slap another woman, because the Bible says that there was an instance when Mary and Elizabeth came in the room. And the Bible says that Mary was pregnant with Jesus and Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. And when Mary walked in the room, the Bible says that John leaped in Elizabeth's womb. The reason why I need you to be next to the right sister is because when you get right to the next sister, she going to make the baby and you leap. I need you to find a woman in here that look like they ain't jealous of you. I need you to find a woman in here who ain't looked you up and down all service and shout, baby, I'm about to make the thing and you leap. Oh, you ain't found the right woman. Find a woman who got a smile on her face. Find a woman who looks anointed and say, baby, when I move, you move. When I go up, you go up. When I get the business, you get the business. When I get rich, you getting rich. I need every woman to shout, I'm a judge too. I can do it too. I'm anointed too. I can build it also. I don't have to be a man to work for God. I can do it in my own skin. Now women, I got to tell you one more thing. Where does she start her business? Test it. Come on back. Tested by trees. She started her business under a tree. Why did she start her business under a tree? Because in the days of Deborah, women were not allowed in the temple. So she said, if you won't let me do it inside, I'll start my business outside. I need to find 500 women that will start under a tree. I need somebody in here to shout out, do it where I am. Now watch this. Either you can start under a tree like Deborah, or you can bite the tree like Eve. Don't bite the apple, Eve. Women, your next season of life is going to be determined by how you handle your trees. Some of y'all can't see the forest for the trees. I'm about to preach. I ain't even really preached yet. No, I, I can't even get all out what I got because cause, cause I done said I'm finished three times already and I know some of y'all going to say something to me about it online, particularly you. Watch this. Zacchaeus saw a tree. He climbed it. Jesus saw a tree, he died on it. Eve saw a tree and she bit from it. Deborah saw a tree and she started a business under it. My question is, what are you going to do the next time you see a tree? A tree is a metaphor for an obstacle designed to keep you from getting where God called you to be. And the greatest thing about a tree is that if you are creative, you can turn it into anything you want. You can turn it into a table. You can turn it into a chair. You can turn it into a house. I dare a woman in here to slap another woman and say, I'm about to turn this tree into something. I'm about to turn this obstacle into something. I'm about to turn this anxiety into something. I'm about to turn this insecurity into something. I'm about to turn this rejection into something. You're going to be tested. My question is this, are you willing to climb it? Are you willing to die on it? You better learn to transform that thing into something you can use. You have too many experiences to be complaining. Women, I know they... I know they're still trying to lock you out, but let me tell you, the door is wide open. Wide open. 
women are going to do things in this next season. That if men don't wake up, we ain't going to be able to catch up. Because if y'all ever start working together, now I got to say what I really came to say. If you go back and read in the book of Luke, when Jesus met the blind man and God spat on his eyes, he asked the blind man, what do you see? He says, I see trees, listen, walking as men. Go back and read it. It's in the book of Luke, chapter 6, I believe around verse 38, somewhere around there, maybe 34, I don't know. But he says, what do you see? I see trees walking as men. Because for some of you, your tree test is people. And most of you will never be able to be a judge because you can't get over your people problem. Preach, man. Everything bother you. Everybody trip you up. They say something about you online and you hate them the rest of your life. They didn't applaud when you walked in the room or commented on your outfit, so they must be hating, and you ain't going to get into your destiny because you can't get along with people. Yeah. Women, have you ever learned to get along with each other? You ask most women who their friends are, they'll tell you right away, I can't get along with women because they too messy. My question is, if you one of them, You better learn how to get along with each other. Otherwise, you're going to miss your opportunity to be the judge. This is one area, women, where you can learn from some men. Because men have the ability to operate around fakeness. You think everybody who voted for the president liked them? I can't be around nobody on like, you better learn. <laughs> Men, listen, we can fight right now and go play basketball. If you get into it with a woman right now, <laughs> she could be your mama. She might not be in the obituary. You ain't going to die to 2090. I can't do her, uh-uh, I can't do her. She fake, period. Because when God elevates you, when your trajectory goes up, the first thing you will see is people. You're not going to change the world in a room by yourself. The Bible says, give and it shall be given in you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom? God says, I'm not even going to bless you. I'm going to use men to do it. So if you can't get along with men, I'm going to cut off your blessing. Most people give their offering and they're waiting on the, it to rain from heaven. No, God says, I'm a, you give me the tithe, I'm going to send it through men. Amen. It don't serve you to be a tither and can't get along with people because he's going to send the blessing through men. Amen. I call you to get over your people problem. Mm. 